Welcome to Blaze Church. My name is Joe and I'm one of the leaders here. We are so excited that you decided to log online and join us for our church online experience. In just a few moments, we're going to have a great time of worship and an amazing message from our pastor Keith Indovino. If you don't know about Blaze Church, we exist to lead people to, to, to know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. If you need anything, leave a comment below. We are going to have leaders on interacting with you during this time of church online. And we are so excited to connect more with you over the coming week. Have an amazing day and get ready for this worship experience.
sovereign wire, I'll rest in your plan. From the depth to the dark, you were there, your promise is strong. I will trust with all that.
Thank you for joining us online today. My name is Keith, and I serve as the lead pastor at Blaze Church, and I'm so glad that you are with us today. You know, um, we are facing a pandemic, right? It's no surprise. Um, all of us are going through this. All of us are experiencing this, and, and it's so easy during this time to panic. In fact, I heard one person say that this is a panic demic. And you know that's true if you go out into the stores. I mean, it, it, just, it feels like the world's ending. It feels like everybody's just kind of out to protect themselves, out to take care of themselves. And, and panic is setting in and fear is setting in. And when that happens, it is so easy for us to be focused on us. For me to make sure that my needs are being met, to make sure that I'm taking care of what I need. Think about it. Who did you take care of most this week? Who is on your mind most? It's so natural for us to begin thinking about me and, and my family and, and my needs and my toilet paper supply and my fridge. And, and when, we, when we live this way, it feeds into the fear. It feeds into the panic that everyone else is experiencing. You know, it's not wrong for us to love ourselves. And don't think that the message of Jesus is you shouldn't care about you and, and you know, only take care of others. No, it's not wrong to love yourself. But if you are a Christian, if you know the, the love of God, if he has changed you, the beauty of being in Christ is that we love our neighbor as our Self. I'm going to ask you to do something right now as you're joining me from wherever you're watching from. I want you to take your hand and, and kind of make it into a fist, okay? Just, just go ahead, take a moment, make it into a fist, and hold it as tightly as you can, and just kind of squeeze this fist. And this is really how so many people are living today. We're just holding on to what we have. We're just kind of keeping a, a tight grip around it. And, and someone comes by and, hey, that's the last piece of chicken on the shelf. Who's going to get it? Right? Th think about if you're just driving on the road and someone's trying to get in, how easy it is for us to kind of speed up our car instead of let that person in. It, we, it's so easy to live with a closed fist. Now, here's what I want you to do. You still have a fist. I want you to slowly begin to open it. Let's just slowly begin. It's a little hard to do. Your fingers are kind of trying to go all the way out. But once you do it, it's such a better way to live. Th this feels lighter. Th this is more peaceful. Th th this, this is a better way to live. Now the question is, how are we going to live with an open hand when right now in society everybody is trying to close their fist? Everybody's trying to get what they can for themselves. Yeah, I was reading this past week, and there's so many articles that encourage us to watch our own backs. If you're not going to watch your own back, and nobody else is going to watch it for you, and so you've got to take care of you. But if you've lived that way for any period of time, you know the stress. You know the, the heartache that goes into that. You know what a burden it feels like to, to always be self-centered and self-absorbed. So what would it look like for you and I to live selflessly during this time, to live with an open hand. And to discover how we're going to do that, we're going to look at a miracle that Jesus performed thousands of years ago and discover how and why it is better to live open-handed than closed fist. So what we've been doing for the month of March, and we're going to continue to do for the weeks to come, is we're looking at the miracles that Jesus performed that his disciple John wrote about. John was one of the 12 disciples. He was there for all of the teachings, all of the miracles, all of the lessons. And John wrote down for us seven signs, seven miracles, so that we might believe in Jesus as the Son of God. At the end of John's writing, John is the fourth book in the New Testament, the second half of the Bible. John says in chapter 20, these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life. And I want you to have life today. I want you to know who God is today. I want you to discover that there's way more for you than what you just see going on around you. I want you to know who the Savior of the world is. 
And so we saw in the first miracle that Jesus is the bridegroom that turned water into wine. And we discover that he's able to transform anything, and he always gives us the very best. His second miracle, Jesus showed us that he is the Lord who has the best plan. That when we surrender our plans to his, we discover how much better he is at planning. And and last week, we saw that Jesus was the merciful Savior, the one who, who shows up to the one who is in need, 38 years paralyzed, and gives him mercy in the house of mercy. Now today, I want to talk about how Jesus is the head chef. Now that's not a term that you're going to find in scripture, but I want you to see that Jesus is the head chef, and we're going to discover why we should live with an open hand instead of a closed fist. And so let's go into our scripture this morning. John chapter 6, starting in verse 1. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee. That is the Sea of Tiberias. Verse 2, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountain He sat down with his disciples. Verse 4, the Jewish Passover festival was near. Let me pause for a second. Because John just gave us a lot of details. And truthfully, they don't really mean too much to us today. Right? I don't care about the Sea of Tiberias or the Sea of Galilee or this Jewish festival. And what does that mean to us? What I want you to understand is that John was writing in the first century when his original audience would have known every place that he just listed. They would have known the season. When he said the Jewish festival was near, they would have known what season it was. When he says that they went by the sea and the shore, they would have known those places. Why does that matter? Because someone could have fact-checked. John, you know about fact checking, making sure that this news story is real and not fake, making sure that these statistics are real and not made up. So John gives us all of this and he's basically saying, fact check me. Go ahead. You know this place. Well, this is the place where Jesus went. It was around the time of the Jewish Passover festival. And what did we read? It said that a great crowd was following him. Now we're going to see that this great crowd is Tens of thousands of people. See, we're going to see in this miracle that there were listed 5,000 men, but that's just the men that were there. And so scholars believe that when you take into account the women and the children, there was more than likely close to 20,000 people that were coming after Jesus. Now, that's a lot of people when you think about it. But also, the region he was in, the population of the town was 40,000 at the time. So think about this. Half of the town is coming towards Jesus. Half of the town has seen his signs, and now they are following him. They want to know more. Who is this Jesus that turned water into wine? Who is this Jesus that healed a man who's paralyzed for 38 years? Who is this Jesus that, that healed a royal official's son without even being near him? And so a great crowd is following. Verse 5 says, When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? Now hold on. We're talking about a crowd of close to 20,000 people. And, And there was no Panera at this time. And even if there was a Panera, I don't think that there's enough bread at Panera for 20,000 people. So, so what is Jesus getting at by asking this question, where are we going to get bread for everybody? Where are we going to get enough bread for these 20,000? And notice he has 12 disciples. He asks Philip. Why Philip? Well, Philip was from Bethsaida, which is just nine miles away from where they are right now on this shore. So, so Philip would have known best where all the good restaurants were. Jesus knows that if Philip knows the area, he figures, Philip, where are we going to eat? This is your hometown. This is where you're from. So so tell us, where are we going to go? I've got a friend who has a a leadership podcast. It's called Multiply Leadership. So shout out to Pastor David Hurtwick. And, And he is a good friend and a foodie. He loves good food. In fact, on his podcast at the end, 
he says, we don't want to just make better leaders. We want to make better eaters. And he always has David's Eats, the, the best food he's eaten recently. And whenever I'm traveling, I always text him and say, Dave, where am I eating? I'm, I'm down here in South Carolina. Where am I going to eat? I'm in Alabama. Where am I going to eat? And he always knows. He, he knows the best locations to eat. So, so Jesus turns to Philip, the foodie, and says, where should we get bread for these people? It's a big question. In fact, I think that Jesus is asking Philip for a human solution to a superhero-sized problem. No one can answer this, Jesus. We can't get enough bread for all these thousands of people. Now, verse 6 is foundational. So, so I want you to, to make sure if you've checked out for a little bit, maybe this is kind of just playing in the background right now on your phone, or maybe you're driving. Listen, I want you to hear verse 6, because this is the verse that you and I need to know as we continue to go through this pandemic. As you continue to go through whatever is a crisis in your life today. Maybe for you, you've got a relational crisis that's taking place. You've got some family members you haven't spoken to in quite some time. Maybe for you, it's financial related. Maybe for you, there's a health crisis. Maybe for you, there's a spiritual crisis. And you haven't experienced God's love. You need to know the words of John chapter 6, verse 6. Here's what they say. He was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. He was testing Philip. Now, let me ask you a question, and I'll give you the answer. Okay, I don't have to be in the same room with you right now to know the answer to this question. Does anyone like tests? The answer is no. Right, come on, we, we don't like tests. Now, maybe you in school, you were good at test taking, and so you didn't mind it so much. But in life, nobody likes to go through a test. No, nobody's, hi, I'd like to sign up for a new test. My life is a little too easy right now. Right, no one's embracing that, and yet tests are vital because what's the purpose of a test? A test shows us or gauges for us what we've learned, what we know. In fact, James, the brother of Jesus, writes in his book, we should count it all joy when we go through a test. We should actually rejoice when we go through hard times. And so I, I want to go back to what we just read it says that he already knew what he was going to do. Right now, I'm going to invite you to preach with me right where you are. I want you to comment. He already knew. Go ahead. You're, you're part of this service right now. Start writing right there on Facebook, right in our chat window. He already knew. Let's encourage each other with this truth. Because what we just read is that when Jesus asked Philip, where are we going to get all the bread? Jesus already had the solution to the problem that was at hand. And Jesus is not being mean by asking Philip a question he can't answer. In fact, he is setting the stage for a miracle. He's making sure that Philip knows the crisis that you are facing right now, this whole we've got to find bread for 20,000 people thing, where can we find that bread? It's a question to cause Philip to trust in Jesus because Jesus already knows what he's going to do. He already has a solution. Man, what we are going through right now as a society, what you are facing in your life today, can I encourage you? Jesus already knows the answer. Jesus already has the solution. And so as we go through a test, we can trust in Jesus to provide the answer. And so Philip, though, he, he doesn't know that this is a test. He, he just sees a big problem. So look at what we read in verse 7. Philip answered him, it would take more than a half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. So Philip does some quick math. Philip looks around that crowd of all those thousands of people, and he just says, man, even if we took half a year's salary just to give them one bite, it would, be, it would take more than that. And I got to think that when Philip is talking about money, you know who's getting nervous, right? Judas. Philip starts saying it would take more than half a year's wages. I think that Judas just hung on to the money bag a little bit tighter, one of Jesus' disciples. No, 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 talking, we're not going to use all this money to feed all these people, right? This, we can't do that. See, what Philip realizes in this moment is maybe what you've been realizing in your life over this past week. The problem is too big. The problem is just too big. We can't handle this. It's too, it's too many people. It's just too big. 
Now, there's another disciple there. His name is Andrew, and he has an idea, but notice he doesn't believe it's going to work. He says in verse 8, another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. And what does he say in verse 9? Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? See, Philip saw what was taking place, and his conclusion was the problem is too big. Andrew sees the little that's at hand, and he concludes the resources are too small. Where do you land in life? Because maybe it's with Philip. You just look around you and you say, man, the problem is way too big. We can't solve this. Or maybe you look at the little options in your life, your finances, your relationships, your health, your career goals, your dreams, your hopes, your desires. All of this is too small. This isn't going to work. This isn't going to satisfy me. This isn't going to help me with my purpose, with my calling. See, what we're experiencing in this moment is what psychologists have called drop in the bucket effect. That's a psychological term for a real condition that we all experience. So some, some psychologists did a study, and they wanted to see that if people would be overwhelmed when they were given certain information, if they feel like the problem's too big, the resources are too small. And so what they did was they sent out letters inviting people to help a cause, to financially give. And to the first group, they told the whole group about a country that was in crisis, how big the problem was. And then to a second group of people, they just told them one story of one person that lived in that country. They kind of shrunk the problem. Same scenario, same issue. But because the second group wasn't overwhelmed, they financially gave more than double what the first group did. See, too often we look at the big problem and the little resources and we conclude, I can't do anything to help out. I'm going to live with a closed fist. At the very least, I can take care of me and my family. But, I mean, what's, what's, what's my little talent going to do? What's a text message going to do at a time like this? It's not going to matter. They don't need to hear from me. Uh, what, 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 what do I have? I've got nothing to offer. And we get overwhelmed because we think it's just a drop in the bucket. Now, I, I've got a couple theories, okay? So we're going to get back into Scripture, but I want to I bring you into my mind. I won't keep you there long. It's... It's a crazy space at times, but I've got a couple theories right now about this crowd in this moment. 20,000 people. Okay, there's moms there. Now, there's one thing I know about my wife, who's a mother, is that she doesn't leave home without food for the kids. Okay, so you can go in her purse at any time, and when they were younger, you could always go into the diaper bag, and you would be able to find some food. And so I got to think in a crowd this size that there are some moms there or maybe there's some dads there or maybe there's just some people there and they've got some food. Hey, bring her over here. She's got a diaper bag. We know there's goldfish in there. We, know, we, we smell animal crackers and apple juice packets, okay? Just, just, so I'm only, it's only a theory, but I just really, th one, one boy out of a crowd of 20,000, the only one with food, the truth is we can't know. But what we can know is this. There was only one boy who was willing to share. I don't know how many people were there that day that had some food on them or had the resources to help others. But I do know that one boy goes down in history. And by the way, this is the one miracle that is recorded in all four Gospels. The first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all record this miracle. So this boy... He, he didn't set out to be famous, but here we are talking about him 2,000 years later. Right? Here we are looking at him and his story and, and realizing he decided to share. He decided to give. And, and this, I think, is the first miracle that leads into the big miracle. Because if you have kids, you know how hard it is to get them to share. And yet this boy is moved to share what little he has. And Andrew doesn't think it's going to be enough. In a crisis where he could have hoarded and said, well, at least I got mine. At least I was smart. I made it out. I got some food. He opens his hand and he shares. And look at what John 6 verse 10 says. Jesus said, have the people sit down. 
there was plenty of grass in that place. And they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Now, I told you that this is recorded in all the Gospels. And so I love that Mark gives us a little bit more information of how they sat down. Mark chapter 6, verse 40 says, so they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. So I want you to picture this scene now. Here goes Jesus, and he tells his disciples, okay, now that we've got five loaves of bread and two small fish, let's have all these people sit down. And when they sit down, put them in groups of fifties and of one hundreds. Now, what's so interesting about this is these people are sitting down, but there's no food for them yet. What are the disciples thinking right now is they're organizing people to sit and eat, but there's nothing to eat. What's going through their head? What's going through the head of the crowd? This is a parent pro tip, okay? Don't call your children to the dinner table until dinner is on the table. Because that's just a recipe for chaos and hanger. Okay, so, so in our family, we call our kids to the table when their food is on the table. We're not going to have you sit and wait. Why would you call me? Or don't worry, dinner's going to be ready in 30 minutes. We just want you to sit and wait. But, but Jesus is organizing this thing like he already knows what he's going to do. So he has them sit. Verse 41, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. Look at this. Jesus takes the little, and he thanks God for it. And man, it has been so easy in my life to thank God when I've got a lot. It's so easy for me to give thanks, to look up to, Lord, thank you for this home. Thank you for our finances. Thank you for this meal. But Jesus does it when there isn't a lot. I think there's something there for us. That no matter what you have or don't have today, you still have the opportunity to be thankful, to be grateful. So Jesus thanks God, and look at the system that he has, okay? The boy gives what he has. Jesus thanks and breaks. Then Jesus gives to the disciples, and then the disciples give it to the crowd. There's a lot of giving going on here. And and I like to imagine that when the disciples went to distribute the food, And they got to the first group of people, that first group of 50. Do you know how they gave out the food? This is just what I think. That they they just came over and said, take one piece. One one piece. Nothing more. Listen, we got five small barley loaves and two fish. You get a small piece. Goes over to the next person. I'm watching you. Take a little bit. Next person. Hey, you see all these people? You you see what we're working with? Just a little bit, not too much. Man, it would have been horrible if you had Judas as the person that was handing out your food. You know you barely got anything from him. And so here's the disciples. They're moving through the crowd, and they're giving, and they're distributing. But I got to believe at some point they realize, hold on, it's still coming. Jesus is still back there breaking and giving. And and I I love it because I'm sure by the time they got to group number 600, right, those groups of people, here, take as much as you want. Do you want some more? Do you want second helpings? Don't worry. We've got an endless supply right now. Just, just keep taking, keep taking. See, that, that, that's how I think this happened because they are now playing what I call the giving game. The giving game is when we start to use Jesus math. What's Jesus math? Well, well we see it the way this miracle ends. Look, look at verse 12 and 13. When they all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. See, what Jesus does is he introduces for us a new way to do math. I call it Jesus math. See, typically we think five plus two equals seven. But now Jesus says, you know, five plus two equals 5,000, remainder 12. In fact, what I want you to do right now is I want you to write that in our comments. Come on, let's encourage each other in this moment. Let's preach together some Jesus math. Go ahead and write this. Five plus two equals 5,000, remainder 12. This is the giving game. 
And when you start to live with an open hand and you start to love your neighbor as yourself and you stop living closed fist and stop just thinking about you and you start thinking about others, you start entering into the giving game. And no, this isn't a prosperity message that says now just send some money to the church and, and just go put some money here in this charity and you're going to get back. No, no, you don't give to get. You get to give. Let me say it again. You don't give so that you might get something. No, the fact is that you and I have something, and so we get to give it away. In the giving game, the goal is not to get back more. The goal is to give away more. And what I love about this game is you and I, we can't win. In fact, it's better to lose. That we just continue to trust God and say, God, with the little that I have, it may not seem like it's going to do much in a crisis, but if you're calling me to send a text message to someone, if you're calling me to check in on my neighbor and see if they need me to go grocery shopping for them, if you're calling me to to do something big for you, God, or even if it seems small, I'm going to do it because I'm playing this game with you, and I'm going to trust you. Man, and when you start doing this, you, you start storing up some eternal treasure. Your value starts being not on the things here and now, but in heaven, in a place where it can never be taken away. And so here we see Jesus introduces this, and the crowd is going wild in this moment. Look at verse 14. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. And this is how the miracle ends, and it's a little interesting. Because why would Jesus run away from people who are calling him king? After all, he's the king. Why would he withdraw to an isolated place when they're worshiping him and seeing him as king? See, what they wanted was they wanted King Jesus to overthrow King Caesar. They wanted Jesus to be the Jewish leader that would take down Rome. They wanted to set him up as king. But but do you remember what John said at the beginning of this story, the time of year it was? He said it was around the Jewish Passover festival that Jesus is now being told, be our king. And he withdraws. And that's because it was the wrong Passover. See, we, we, we see throughout Jesus' life, John records for us different Passover festivals that Jesus celebrated. And this wasn't the one where he was to be set up as king. But there would be one. On the night before he would be crucified, it was the Jewish Passover. And in this night, I want you to see what Jesus does. And, and tell me if this sounds familiar to you. In light of the miracle we just read and the expectation of the crowd, look at what Jesus does there. He took some bread and gave thanks for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples. This all sounds like what we just read. He took bread. He gave thanks to God. He broke it. He gave it to the disciples. But this time, look at the purpose. Saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, we call this today the Lord's Supper or communion. Or maybe you're you're from a persuasion that says the Eucharist, to give thanks. See, this is when Jesus took the Passover festival, the Passover meal, which they would always break bread, and they would do it to remember, not Jesus, they would remember God who freed them through Moses from Egyptian slavery. They would remember that a lamb died instead of them and that they were covered so an angel might pass over them and come against their enemies. But now Jesus says, no, no, now when you go to do this, you're going to remember me. This final Passover wasn't about filling stomachs the way that fourth miracle was. It was about filling hearts. See, this final Passover, it wasn't where Jesus would be lifted up on a throne and be called king. No, he would be lifted up on a cross. And Pilate would have a sign nailed above his head that said, Behold, King of the Jews. See, this would be the moment where King Jesus would satisfy everybody. Just as he did that day when that boy lived with an open hand, now he was going to satisfy everyone with eternal life with the goodness of salvation. 
See, the miracle that you need and the miracle that I need is found in Jesus. It's found in him alone. It is salvation. It's why he went on to say that day after he performed that miracle that he is the bread of life, that he is the one who sustains us, that he is the one who satisfies us. And look at how generous God is. You see, God lived with an open hand. Here's the gospel. If you've heard that term before, the gospel or the good news, here's what we mean when we say that at Blaze Church. We mean that God loved, so God gave. God loved the world so much that he gave us his son. He opened his hands and sent his son. Because you and I, we need a savior. We need someone who will stand in the place for us. And that's what Jesus did. He paid the price for your sin and for mine on the cross so that we might be saved. God loved, God gave. We believe and we receive. I'm telling you, during this panic-demic, during this crisis, we can trust God because he already knows the solution. And when we know that he already knows, that changes how we live our lives. See, now I don't have to live my life showing up as someone in that crowd that says, I need to be taken care of. I've got to get mine. No, you love yourself. We've talked about that. It's not wrong to love yourself and take care of yourself. But we are also called to love our neighbor as ourself. What did the disciples do that day? They distributed to others. And then at the end, they picked up a basket. How many? 12. They were taken care of. But because of Jesus, because they could trust him, because he is the solution, they lived as servers, as waiters. See, I I think that right now, so many people are saying the world is ending and, and the sky is falling. Listen, listen, God already knows what he's going to do. Come on, encourage each other right now as we're part of this online experience. Put a comment there. God already knows. God's got a plan. You're not forgotten about. See, I believe this too shall pass. And I don't think the sky is falling. I think the clouds are opening up so the light of Jesus can be on display. And if you will share what you have, you will see miracles during this crisis. And that is not a promise that if you go give your neighbor a roll of toilet paper, you're going to get back and there's going to be 24 for you, okay? We're we're not going to oversell you on anything. But what's going to happen is when you start to see people around you who are in need and you start to respond to those needs, you're going to experience the miracle of joy. You're going to have peace when the people around you maybe don't. And now you get to serve them. And now you get to be peace to them. And now you get to shine the light of Jesus to them. See, the disciples were servants and waiters. They weren't hoarders. And what I want to invite you to do this this day is I want you to declare that you're a server. If you want to. If you're saying, you know what, I I don't want to live the way that everyone else is right now. I I don't want to be filled with fear any longer. I don't want to just be thinking of me. No, I want to serve others. If that's where you're landing, I want you to comment right now. I am a server. I am a server because I'm telling you, if this world will see more servers instead of those who want to just consume, we are going to start to change the landscape of our town and our society. We are going to start to show people the love of Jesus and the peace of God when we show up and say, hey, I'll buy your groceries for you. What? That's crazy. It's not crazy. It's just I'm telling you, I already I know the guy that knows the solution. You go to your neighbors, maybe you call them, you text them, hey, do you need anything? I'm running out to the store. It's on me. It may seem like the resources are so small, but we can all do something to be a server. If you, if you have a burden to send a text message to someone, send the text. Encourage them. Ask them how they're doing. Reach out. Message them on Facebook. Can I pray for you? Our church has prayer Wednesday nights at 930 on Facebook. You want to join me? But this is the way that we begin to serve others and live with an open hand. And when our hands are open, God could fill it back up so that we can give it away again. That's why we continue to say here we are a radically generous church. It's why even if this building isn't open right now, the church will always be open. We will continue to be radically 
generous. We will continue to financially give and to help those who are in need. And so I, we're going we're gonna to sing a song now called Build My Life. And I want this song to encourage you. Wherever you're joining us from, I want you to sing and worship. I, I want you to just make this your prayer. That you're going to say, you know what, Jesus, I could build my life on so many other things. I could live for so much else. I could live with a closed fist, but no, Jesus, I'm going to build my life on you. I am a server. This week, I want you to serve somebody. I want you to give. I want you to find someone who's in need in your life online. Maybe it's a, it's a coworker, Maybe it's a family member, a friend, a neighbor. Maybe it's just someone you don't know, but you're out shopping the same time they are. And so you say, hey, I, I'll buy that for you. Because you are going to be someone's miracle this week. You are going to discover the joy of serving others. And so right now, I want to pray for you. So I'm going to invite you to bow your heads where you are. And I want to pray. Lord, may we be servers this week. May we not live with a closed fist. May we not be so focused on us that we miss the people around us. Lord, I, I want to be like that boy in that crowd. He didn't allow the enormity of the problem to stop him. He didn't let the little resources he had tell him, no, it's not enough. God, make that our culture here at Blaze Church. That we would give. That, that we would serve. That we would love others. Because that's exactly what you did for us. God, you gave. You loved. Jesus, you came and you served. And so we want to do the same. Right now, I want to pray for you if, if you don't know who Jesus is as your Savior. Maybe this is just on it. Maybe you just jumped on our experience with us. Someone shared it with you or invited you. Well, let me tell you that God loves you. He has a plan for your life. We believe you were created on purpose for a purpose. But that sin and selfishness gets in the way of us knowing our creator and knowing his goodness and, and the peace of God that goes beyond understanding. But God sent his son Jesus to this world to serve, to give his life up, to pay the price for our sins so that you and I might have eternal life in him. Not just someday in heaven, but right now in the middle of crisis, you can know the peace of God. And if you want to know God, I want to invite you to comment right now. I want to know Jesus. Go ahead, put that right down here. I want to know Jesus because we want to celebrate with you and walk with you to having a personal relationship with God. We've got resources we want to get to you, and I want to lead you in a prayer right now. And so if you want to know Jesus today, I'm going to invite you to pray this with me. Maybe you've never prayed before, so let these words be your words. But say this with me. Heavenly Father, I am a sinner who needs saving. I believe that Jesus died and rose again so I could be forgiven. Thank you for new life. Today I give you mine. Thank you for making me brand new. In Jesus' name, amen. We believe that if you prayed that prayer, you are saved in Jesus' name. The old is gone and the new has come, and we want to celebrate with you. So before you leave our online experience, leave that comment, I want to know Jesus, and one of our leaders is going to connect with you about the resources we have and about all that God wants to do in your life. Well, hey, I want to worship Jesus with you right now. And so let's go into this song, Build My Life Together. And let's just not make it a song, but may it be our prayer as we say, Jesus, we are servers for you. Let's sing this out together. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one.
Awesome worship experience and encouraging message from our pastor. If you're new here, I just want to say a special thank you for joining us online today at Blaze Church. I'd love for you to head over to blazechurch.org slash home and fill out a digital connect card for us. Our pastors would love to connect with you during the week and get to know you a little bit better. And coming up on April 5th, we have new here, which is especially for you if this is your first or second time joining us online. If you can head over to blazechurch.org slash new here and sign up, it will be a digital Zoom call where you get to know our pastors and get to know our church a little bit better. And as Pastor Keith always says, we are a radically generous church. And I want to invite you to experience the joy of giving. One way that you can give is head over to blazechurch.org slash give, or you can text your giving to 84321. And if you'd like to give by cash or check, you can still mail that to our church office. Our address is on our website. And I'd like to invite you to join with me as we pray over today's giving. Dear Jesus, thank you, Lord, that it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. Thank you for your radical generosity towards us on the cross and for all that you have blessed us with in our lives. Help us to trust you, Lord. Bless and multiply our giving today. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow, church, I'm so excited for all that God did today in you and through you. I hope you have an awesome week. We'll see you next time.